American original. For over three decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. Welcome to a special edition of the McLaughlin Group. I'm Tom Rogan, your host. Joining us today are Pat Buchanan, Eleanor Clift, Clarence Page, and Emily Zyshinsky. Obviously, because of circumstances in the nation and around the world, with the national emergency as produced by the coronavirus, we're doing this show a little bit differently from usual. But we hope that you will appreciate uh, the consideration of these very important issues that hopefully we can bring to bear today. And we also want to say to all of you, uh, whether you be uh, well or ill, uh, we are thinking of you. Uh, we are grateful for your supporters, our fans, uh, and uh, together as a country, I'm sure we will come out of this stronger. Anyway, enough from me. Let's get on to our first issue, which is issue one, national emergency. And I watched the doctors and the nurses walking into that hospital uh, this morning. It's like military people going into battle, going into war. The bravery is incredible. The president sought to boost public confidence this week as the coronavirus pandemic spread across America. Still, the White House is assessing that 200,000 deaths may be a low estimate for the casualties to come. And with a vaccine not expected to be available until mid-2021, the world is settling in for the long haul. One big question, how long can the lockdown underway in many states and cities last without causing irrevocable economic and social harm? Okay, Pat, why don't you start us off? How do you see the president's handling of this crisis as he has seen to develop towards a more concerned posture uh, and move away from perhaps reopening the economy as he had suggested he wanted to do uh, just a little bit a uh, while ago? Well, basically, Tom, I think the, the president was clearly, uh, he knew about the issue. I think he's moved without all deliberate speed, but I think he's doing an excellent job now. We're aware of, everyone's aware of how things are going. I think the country's doing well in the terms of folks sheltering in place. I think it's gonna endure. My concern is if we move through April and May without flattening that curve, you're gonna see a lot of Americans adopt sort of the spirit of spring break, if you will, and really start coming out of their homes before they should do it. But, you know, I'm hopeful. I think we got a good team there. There's no doubt that we started without masks, without gowns, with an insufficient number of, of ventilators and respirators. But I think we're all moving together, and frankly, I'm pretty hopeful now. Eleanor? Well, I think uh, the president's briefing on uh, Wednesday this week, or maybe it was Tuesday, the days kind of crowd together, where he basically... Uh, announced that we're in for a rough couple of months. And he apparently has uh, listened to the Corona Task Force, the public health officials that serve on it, and he has looked at the numbers. And he basically said that uh, the best case scenario would be 100,000 lives lost, worst case 240,000. But without the mitigation and the, the staying in place that now most of the country is under, uh, there could be millions of deaths. I cannot give him an A grade for how he's handled this. I think he's been late, late to it. We lost a couple of uh, weeks, if not a month, at the beginning of the year uh, when he and his allies were calling this a hoax and uh, downplaying it. And he still is reluctant to put the full weight of the federal government behind uh, the supply lines. I mean, why he doesn't, he has Peter Navarro, who is a professor who specializes in trade, uh, heading up uh, the supply uh, demands. Uh, and uh, the Democratic leader, Chuck Schumer, said he needs to put a general in there. It reminds me of after, during the Katrina horror, during the, the Bush administration, a uh, General Honore uh, came in there and really managed to, you know, to instill confidence and efficiency. And I don't think we're seeing that yet from the national government, although Trump has come up a long way from uh, the days when he was uh, saying that this was a made-up issue. Clarence, do you want to jump in there? Well, yeah, I certainly uh, agree with Eleanor in that there, there's a difference now between the Trump we see now and the Trump we saw initially, uh, uh, who did try to talk down the, the whole, uh, um, but it was now clearly, clearly a crisis for the United States as well as the countries that hit, uh, hit earlier, including China. Uh, and uh, at the same time, 
uh, he's getting a lot of a lot of latitude from the public because we're looking for a good leader. We need a good leader right now. Uh, I think a, a better leader than him. Uh, he gave himself a ten a week ago. I'd give him a, a five at best. But this week he sounded like he really had a better grasp of the of the the, the great depth and uh, and, and breadth of the problem. He was uh, more uh, somber beginning of the week. Uh, a much better mood that, that he uh, put forth. Uh, he's kept Anthony Fauci, despite rumors about Fauci being in trouble for being candid. Uh, Fauci does have the credibility that the president lacks when it comes to the technical side. And, and he still, the president still insists on, on, on pushing a, a, a drug that uh, is not approved, has not been uh, subject to, uh, to thorough scientific study. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, he's not getting in the way of Fauci. He's just kind of, they're both kind of carving out uh, uh, areas of agreement to emphasize. Uh, and uh, everything is kind of loping along. One area that, well, a, a bunch of people who need some credit are the governors. Uh, the governors have picked up the slack, uh, particularly in states like uh, uh, Maryland, the Republican governor there, uh, uh, New York, California, Illinois, and uh, that is making a difference on the ground. Uh, but again, there's an area of relationship with, with the governors that the president has been too political about. Do you think as well, Emily, though, that part of the president's evolution here seems to have been that you know, he was skeptical of, he's been skeptical of technocrats of what he would call the deep state, the, the experts, uh, we might say, or, you know, whatever. He, he, he would obviously have a different interpretation. But as he has sort of looked at more of the data, he has stepped up to the plate and he has made decisions, quite frankly, that go against his gut. And uh, we should credit him for that, no? Well, I do think he's had a good week. I think he's had roughly a good couple of weeks with some moments here or there that he probably should take back. But at the same time, I think to your question, what's important is that the data itself has evolved. We heard Dr. Burks say just this week that the initial data China was providing made this outbreak look more like SARS than what we're seeing right now. And so as the data itself has evolved, I think the government's response has evolved. I think Eleanor used a word I want to key in on, and that's efficiency, because we're now at a point where the spring breakers are largely off the beaches, and we're dealing not only with containing the outbreak on the medical side, but the economics. In the past two weeks, we've had 10 million people apply uh, with jobless claims, 10 million 10 million people. We don't fully understand what the economic ramifications of this pandemic are going to be yet, but we do know that based on the legislation that was rushed through Congress, uh, with some delays, actually rushed with some delays, it's a funny kind of phrase, but we do know that that legislation is going to result in people perhaps not getting checks for as late as five weeks from now. That is not efficient, and that some of the fault for that does certainly lie with the president, but it lies in the inefficiencies of Congress, ultimately. We wish, I know Eleanor and Clarence wish we had a different commander in chief, wish we had a different president, but he's the one we have now. And as Lincoln said, they have a right to criticize who have a heart to help. We are all in this together. America was unprepared, the world was unprepared, Britain was unprepared, China handled it horribly, but we're all in this together, supporting the president. I think he's moving in the right way. He needs advice and counsel, he's getting it. I think the two doctors up there he's got are excellent. And the key thing is, the American people are voting their vote of confidence in the president. His poll rating is at 49%, 60% approval for how he's handling this. And I think mainly the media, which is the only institution which is underwater for its performance in the polls, really ought to say, in effect, look, we, want it. we got some ideas we'd like to contribute, but we're all in this, and we hope Donald Trump and the country succeed. I'd like, I'd like to say something, Pat. I don't like the insinuation that somehow we want this president to fail. I want this president to succeed as much as you do. Okay, let's get to issue two, calculating China. Chinese state media this week celebrated the return to their home cities of doctors stationed at the center of the coronavirus outbreak in Hubei province. The carefully choreographed propaganda reflects the growing global debate over how well China has handled the coronavirus crisis. Beijing insists it did everything possible to constrain the epidemic, and adds that it has provided invaluable support to foreign populations in need. 
But while China has indeed sent medical and support teams around the world, it has also hoarded medical equipment. And as with a recent deal with Spain, a deal with hundreds of millions of dollars, sold inferior equipment abroad. And others, notably Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, say that China concealed relevant data on the early days of the coronavirus outbreak last December and in early January. Clarence, why don't you start us off on this and then I'll go to Emily because I didn't give her enough time in the last issue. But Clarence, how do you see China's performance both in the early days of December and January when the outbreak in Wuhan and Hubei province uh, first occurred and also China's response in terms of provision of aid, uh, some of it inadequate uh, in terms of quality to the international community now? Well, like President Trump, the Chinese leadership was reluctant to acknowledge that they had a real problem here with the, with the virus uh, to the point of, of, of suppressing and uh, uh, even jailing one doctor who was uh, one of the early whistleblowers on this. Uh, uh, they obviously did a 180. Uh, and, and now I think that we look and see what, what they have done. We see that they've done some positive things for us to uh, imitate or emulate. Uh, but also, we still can't trust their numbers. I mean, just because of their reputation uh, is such that uh, when, when uh, they give numbers that tell us that the United States now has more casualties than they do, uh, it's hard to, to, to believe them. It may be true, uh, but uh, again, that's, that's a typical ongoing problem uh, in, in dealing with China. Uh, but uh, they're, they're dealing with this problem uh, um, well now, partly because they've had experience with similar uh, flu outbreaks in the past. Emily, do you want to jump in there? Yes, absolutely. As Clarence mentioned, early in the, the, in the early days of this outbreak, China censored and jailed doctors. They let five million people leave Wuhan. Five million people. It took them seven weeks to really start taking action. And in that time, the outbreak was able to spread within Wuhan and out because it was so porous with five million people leaving. We're already seeing the results of their cover-up right now because Dr. Burks is, as she said this week, the data that they passed out worldwide showed that being on a much lower scale, much smaller scale. And not only that, China is currently deflecting and calling the United States racist and waging a propaganda campaign to blame us for this outbreak. And by the way, it's particularly rich to be called racist by a country that jails and um, has camps for ethnic minority Muslims. So China has handled this atrociously. The cover-up is incontrovertible at this point. It costs American lives, it costs American jobs, and it costs American businesses. And the way that that we handle it after the fog of war settles is going to be absolutely crucial. Eleanor, do you want to come in? They behaved reprehensibly, uh, and they deserve uh, all the criticism uh, they're, get, they're getting for that. And in fact, there's even been some discussion that countries could sue China for reparations because they allowed basically a localized virus uh, to escape, and then they, they covered it up. But having said that, uh, we, we're accustomed to dealing with regimes, and they call it in the foreign policy world, it's bifurcation. They have what's going on on the one hand is despicable, on the other hand, they know a lot. Uh, they did share uh, what's known about, is, I don't know if I'm using the right language, the DNA of this virus early on. Uh, they are now supplying masks. I think masks arrived in New York from China. They are sending their medical people around the world to help, and you know, we. As Pat said earlier, we're all in this together, and that includes China, and they are now extending a helping hand. And they did learn something, and they apparently have been successful in tamping down uh, this virus because they are opening uh, Wuhan and, 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 and commerce is taking place. They may be in for a second wave after you uh, lift the restrictions on people, but you know they have something to teach us now, and we need to understand that. I'm not sure that the Communist Party of China has a great deal to teach the United States, except how the Communist Party's really behaved. In the Chinese language, we used to say back in the days when he was going to China, the character for crisis is split into two characters. One says crisis, and the, one says opportunity, the other says danger. What the Chinese did was criminally irresponsible at the beginning of the Wuhan flu, as it's known, or the Hubei province flu in covering it up. Since then, they have sought to, as a communist party, well, to maximize their advantage from it by sending these provisions all over the world to something like 80 or even more than 100 countries. I think there's no doubt they're trying to disuse this as an opportunity to displace the United States as the leader of the world in a 
world crisis. And in that sense, they're being very effective in what they're doing and trying to do, and they are making quasi friends around the world from what they're trying to do. Who wants, who wants to jump in here on any of those points? Uh, I, I, I agree with Pat, and they are, they are taking advantage of uh, the openings that they see, and they're trying to clean up what could, would otherwise be a massive public relations disaster for them, and they're having some success in doing that. Clarence, do you think there is going to be any prospect of uh, a shift in terms of the, uh, the narrative on China towards much greater scrutiny uh, of the regime on, on issues beyond this, whether that be their commitment to carbon reduction in climate change, where there's some doubts, significant doubts about statistics. Do you think this is going to alter how we see China, uh, how we address China beyond coronavirus? Well, I think uh, we could certainly see the division in China between the political side, as Pat was uh, re referring to uh, the Communist Party leadership uh, and their scientific community, which has uh, had some significant breakthroughs, uh, but they're, they're, they're running into the lack of freedom, academic freedom, press freedom, uh, and freedom of expression. Uh, that gets in the way of research. It gets in the way of commerce. Uh, in the past, they, they've constantly had to dance uh, around uh, that uh, with uh, a system which is essentially, uh, as I've said before, uh, not really communist, but it's uh, state capitalism, where the state uh, tries to control uh, the system as much as possible while they, they allow uh, profits to be made. Uh, and, and that's the kind of a system that uh, uh, can, uh, as I say, be very inefficient. At the time you okay. it. There's a mad dash uh, to find a vaccine, and uh, they could well be first. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But, you so, know, there's, there's uh, really a uh, and I demonstration. Would also like, excuse, yeah, excuse yeah. me, I would also yeah. like to mention uh, President Trump <laughs> Uh, really values his relationship with the president of China, President Xi, and uh, the president, uh, he has stopped calling the virus the China, Chinese virus, uh, and so, I mean, I, I actually think it's a good thing that he's got a good relationship. All right. All right. All right. Think, wait, wait a minute, Tom. There's one point I want to make. Okay. The absurdity of the United States in the 1990s and early 2000s, for which Republicans, as well as Clinton Democrats and others are responsible, of beginning to rely upon China for the vital necessities of our national life and our personal survival, drugs, prescriptions, medicines, vital elements of your defense, of your defense weapons and the other thing. I think there's going to be a national debate on whether the United States should decouple to a degree the American economy from the Chinese economy as a result of this whole virus thing. And I do think, though, in the, in the short run, we are in this together, but we want to be thinking about the future. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the third issue. Issue three, it's an election year. Uh, you have nurses showing up wearing garbage bags as uh, over their bodies as protection. Where are the masks going? Are they going out the back door? We need to get them the help they need right away. Our message is to all Americans, we love them, we're with them, and we will not let them down. I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. The Trump and Biden presidential campaigns offer very different narratives of President Trump's handling of the coronavirus pandemic. But Trump looks to have won some favor from the American people. Gallup's most recent polling data suggests the president's approval rating has risen five points to 49%. Okay, Emily, in terms of Joe Biden's campaign narrative and President Trump's campaign narrative in terms of uh, the coronavirus, what qualities both men believe they could bring to the table. How do you see this electorally at the moment? Because again, you know, it's, it's, it's out of our minds in many ways, but we are in an election year and we're getting closer to a November election day. I mean, how do you see this playing out with Biden and Trump? Yeah, apparently. I mean, who could who could remember? Um, but it's it's actually a really serious point because this is going to hinge on two very huge uncertainties right now, enormous uncertainties. The first of which is how many lives are tragically lost. And the second of which is what this does to the economy. And that's going to be very important for President Trump to deal with. One interesting thing that's happened is as the president's approval rating has climbed a little bit in the past week, he's moving the needle with independence. That is bad news for Joe Biden. And so if we were really close to the election right now, um, you know, that you could look at this as sort of going really well for Donald Trump in terms of electoral politics. But at the same time, remember that, and Dr. Fauci has said this, all of the experts have said this, we expect this to 
re resurge again in the fall. And the election is the first week of November. So that could be a huge factor in addition to all of the unknowns in terms of that final number of lives and uh, what happens really to the economy. So right now it's just so hard to say, but we do know this is going to be a presidential election like none other. We can know that at least. Well, the Democrats have moved the convention to August 17. I guess there's still some hope they might from July, some hope they might get together. But there's this little boomlet to draft uh, Governor Cuomo for president because Democrats like his leadership and they think he can really take it to Trump. That's not gonna happen, he's not in the race, so Biden is well ahead. But uh, Biden needs Bernie Sanders to get out of the race so that he can proceed to name a running mate and he, can, he doesn't have to do it this month. And I think the fact that he's basically gone quiet, I mean, he's doing some interviews and he basically, tells the host, thank you for having me on, so people can know where I am. He's in his basement in Delaware. Uh, th there's time for him uh, to emerge, and this the election will be a referendum on the president and his leadership, and his leadership on the, on the coronavirus, principally. You know, that I agree with Eleanor that the election is going to be about how Donald Trump handles the coronavirus, and if he's seen to have led the country successfully through the crisis, I don't see how Joe Biden beats him. Biden, for in the last month, you got to realize, exactly one month ago today, Biden won the greatest victory of his career, 10 out of 14 states, won Super Tuesday. Since then, he's been sheltering in place. And when he emerges oh, yeah. on, these, <laughs> on these Skypes, he's wandering around like he's lost in his basement. And it's not a... It is not a vision that is really dramatic for the American people. He's been replaced by Cuomo because whether you agree or disagree with what Cuomo is saying, he's out there talking and speaking and leading. And I think if Biden doesn't do that, he's getting closer and closer in the polls to, with uh, Trump losing his lead. I honestly believe, and it'll be my prediction, Tom, that Biden is, it may, it may get the convention, but the Democratic Party, that the folks that control the party, are going to take a second look at Joe, especially the lapses in memory, lapses in mental acuity, and see if he can really handle it in the debates. All right, well, Clarence. Thanks, thanks for building up the gate. Th thanks for building up the gate for the de <laughs> debates, Pat, because I, uh, this reminds me of, uh, what was it, eight years ago, 10 years ago now, since uh, Biden debated Sarah Palin. And I was hearing the same things going into it, that, uh, hey, Sarah Palin's a really attractive candidate, and Joe Biden's not as sharp as he used to be. I mean, that, that's what's going to really tell the tale in, in the fall. Number two, Democrats can take some hope from the fact that, that uh, 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 all, all that, that the President Trump has got going for him right now, he still hasn't risen above 50 percent in the polls. Uh, he's still, and that's a, a record low since polling began for a president, especially a successful president uh, in, in as much as he's been successful. Let Clarence finish and then I'll come back to you, Pat. Clarence, continue. Well, 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 you a question, Pat? No, he wasn't at 50% when he beat Hillary. This is, you know, this is an electoral college game. Yes. And I said, one latest poll I saw that Biden was two points ahead of Trump. If that's the case, he's going to lose the election. Well, Hillary beat, but hit, hit, let Hillary me ask you, let me mention, give, Pat. let me see your Hill, point, uh, Clarence. Biden to lose Michigan, I can Look, see where you're finding help in that regard. All right, Clarence, Pat. you're right. Biden won the debate, I think, I'm not sure with Sarah Palin, she was terrific, but he won the debate with Paul Ryan. There's no doubt about it. That's 2012. But that is right. not the same Joe Biden we see. Do you think he's as sharp and quick and witty as he used to be, and the good old Joe, when you I see agree, him he's on out television? Of training. <laughs> I agree, he's, he's out of training, and yet he is good old Joe. He's very familiar with, with the voters. Huh? That's why I don't the see training. Cuomo getting anywhere right now All in right. the future. But right now, I think it's going to be a contest. I agree, it's going to be a contest, and I would just ask one question. Has an incumbent president ever been reelected in a recession slash depression? Just asking. Emily? Emily, on, on that note, any other thoughts on this sort of political situation we find ourselves in now? Very hard I mean, to predict. I, I agree strongly with Pat that Biden is going to struggle, I think, to project the strength that voters want to see in a crisis. I think that's definitely something to watch. I do think his videos have not been successfully to, uh, projecting that level of strength that people want to see. Um, I think, you know, it's it's not good to, and to some extent it is good for Joe Biden to not be out in front of crowds, but he can't even stage the kind of publicity that he wants at this point. We'll see how long it lasts, but I do think um, if he does continue to bumble and fumble his way through the campaign, 
campaign, he's people are going to be looking for a strong leader. And I think, love him or hate Donald Trump, he has projected the image of a leader by having these daily task force briefings coming out strong. Um, so I, I think there could be a contrast issue for Biden. Well, where, where's he leading us? That's the question. <laughs> <That's very excellent. laughs> you know, uh, if Biden were to get out and ignore the orders that everybody else is following, uh, just to satisfy your need for strength, I think that would backfire. This is not this is not the time for him to be out there. There is time after we get through this very cruelest month. Let's go to our, our or at least some of our fans' favorite moment of the show: predictions. Okay, so predictions, Pat. I, as I predicted, I do think there's going to be an establishment move to replace Joe Biden. Okay, Eleanor. I think uh, the president is going to have to hire a general to oversee the supply lines coming out of the White House. And he likes generals. I think he's going to do it. Maybe Jim Mattis. Emily. Um, I predict you're going to start seeing the right turn on Dr. Anthony Fauci. I think we saw a little bit of this week. I expect that to escalate in the days ahead. Interesting. Clarence. I think we're going to see a, a future for uh, Zoom TV and the use <laughs> of this <the> talk shows. <laughs> and I, I, I will say that I hope that our fan, uh, Mark Bernstein, who's in, in the UK, uh, is a fan of the show, unfortunately has coronavirus, but I believe he's doing okay. I hope he gets better. Uh, and I predict that at some point soon, hopefully, I will not be surrounded by such an odd aura of light. Anyway. That will be, I think, it for this show. Thank you very much for watching. We appreciate it. Okay, issue four, the future. So when coronavirus is finally eliminated by vaccine or other measures, what will our world look like? How will this global pandemic leave its mark on our future? Will socializing change? Will bars and restaurants ever fully recover? What will this mean for bio-research? How will this affect America's relationship with China? Many questions are raised by this extraordinary moment in our history. Emily, why don't you take this one in terms of how we're looking at the uh, potential ramifications over the longer term when we've passed through this crisis, when either because of a vaccine uh, or because of some other treatment, uh, essentially it has faded away. What do you think will change in society, politics, our relationship with China? Pick one and, and just run with it. 
Sure. Well, I think the ramifications will obviously be sweeping and dramatic and sort of downstream of the medical um, and the economic ramifications. I think the cultural ramification is going to be the, the primary cultural ramification is going to be a reconfiguration of our lives online and offline. I think you're going to see that in the workplace. I think you're going to see that, frankly, when we even talk about Hollywood, um, you know, movie theaters right now may never really recover from the economic havoc that's being wreaked on them um, throughout this period. And so will people stop going to movie theaters and will new releases be going straight to video on demand? Small things like that, small lifestyle changes that this could actually just accelerate um, that will have us thinking differently about what we do online, what we do offline. Some people are predicting the amount of time that we spend online during this crisis will um, remind us how important it is to spend times in community, to spend time in communities and to be together collectively. So I think that's possible as well. But either way, I think we'll see a reconfiguration um, of the way that we sort of divide those times. Very interesting. Clarence, you want to jump in? There? Well, I think we're going to see more of a recognition of how we're going through one of the biggest social economic changes since the cultural, or since the industrial revolution, and that is the formation of a new class structure. Uh, those who can work from home and those who can't. That is what we are saying. We're living through it right now, uh, and we're going to see more and more now. Oh, this is a big concern because uh, learning at home, distance learning, is, is a great idea, but a lot of folks, uh, uh, their kids don't have access to a laptop. Uh, that sort of a, a challenge is going to be uh, really define uh, those who uh, are the haves and the have-nots of the future. Pat or Eleanor? Um, go ahead, Eleanor. I'll go next. Okay. Um, I think we didn't talk in this in this episode about the uh, legislation that came out of the Congress and how they've passed legislation of throwing trillions of dollars at the economy. We are going to see how this plays out whether it can uh, rescue businesses, whether a lot of people are going to go under, what happens to the gig economy. Uh, and I think there is a, a, a necessary role for government that, again, Republicans have denigrated government for years. And uh, now there, that there was a voice vote and they approved the $2 trillion. And, you know, we're all socialists now, I guess. Uh, there's a role for government to play here. And let's see how that uh, continues. I don't know if we're going to be able to help the, uh, the number of people that, that we need to help. We could be looking at, uh, at an unemployment rates that rival and exceed the Great Depression. And Pat, on that point, do you think there is a, at, at some level here, we're going to start having to have a conversation about ultimately uh, what level of casualties we might be willing to accept, uh, perhaps, because of simply how catastrophic the economic impact uh, could be here on so many American families and the ensuing social and health effects uh, that would flow from that economic catastrophe. Well, I think, I think you've got a very good point there, Tom. The, I think people will, you know, shelter in place and avoid others, stay at a distance, I think, into April and May. But if, and, and hopefully the curve will fly and, and then, but then folks are going to start coming out. And if there's a second wave, I think we're in for some real trouble. Now, I, I credit the president. He's very optimistic. We're going to have a V-shaped up. You know, when the economy goes down, it's going to shoot back up. I'm afraid I'm very much a skeptic on that. I mean, after all this distancing, are we going to go down to the restaurant, which has usually been crowded with your buddies in there, and get together when you realize one of them may have one of these have been infected by this disease, which could kill you? I agree with Eleanor. Some of the movie theaters, I'm not sure they're ever going to come back. It's going to take too long for them. I do think there's going to be a total change in the attitude toward consumerism and all this junk down at the mall that we've been relying on. And basically, I know the generation that came through the Depression, which were my parents, you know, they're very frugal people. You know, you get a Christmas gift, you get one gift under the tree and things. And this new, I mean, the millennials and others, do that, I think you're going to get a reintroduction of some of those values. And the spring break values, I think, are still going to be around, but it's going to be a minority. Emily, do you want to continue on that thing? As a millennial, uh, <laughs> Tom and I are 
those consumerists uh, heavily. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think so last week we look at the numbers, there were more suicides in Tennessee than there were coronavirus deaths. And so we have to, of course, take into account that uh, recessions and depressions certainly cost lives on their own. And I think it's important for us to consider that going forward. If we do start getting past May, um, it may come to a point that the uh, economic catastrophe. Looks like we actually are going to start having to try to uh, integrate ourselves back into daily life. I don't know. I, I hope. I mean, we've already seen, I think, a lot of ingenuity and innovation um, in the free market throughout this period. I mean, there are people coming up with apps that are just incredible. And so I hope that, you know, it's it's a relatively short period of time, but I hope that in these weeks ahead that there can be some creativity into how we can integrate back into but Trump life. has flirted with this. You know, you don't want the, the, the cure to be worse than the problem. It doesn't have to be a trade-off. I mean, the old don't have to die so that the economy can revive. You need to have massive testing, and then you know who's had it, who, who might be uh, immune, you know who's carrying it. If we had massive testing, we would know, know a lot more. The president seems to suggest the tests are available. Talk to anybody who's tried to get a test. Listen to the governors. They're not available. I mean, Trump did make me laugh when he said the swab, they stick the... The, the, the swab up your nose and they take a right turn at your eye. I guess he didn't like the test very much, but um, they're now talking about this test you can do at home. The backlog in the laboratories, they're like weeks. Uh, I, I do know of, of, of people who've been tested and are waiting like 10 days later and they still don't know. So that's inexcusable. They need to clean that up. If we get more, more widespread testing, we can at least get a handle on where we are with this disease, and that should help with the opening up of, of you know, more restrictions. There's a lot of hope for a new, new test. It only takes about 15 minutes, but uh, uh, still there's a shortage of swabs. Yeah. So, Tom, Tom, in the yeah, long China, run, I'm sure. take a look at what's happening in the South China Sea and everything. We've got that, the Theodore Roosevelt's got 100 sailors there who are sick. They put it into port. I don't think they're going to take it out again with a smaller complement and how many get sick. I think people are really going to start looking at larger issues. I mean, and I think in this sense, secure borders is a winner this year. I agree with Eleanor that the idea of people relying upon government, every Republican but one, voted unanimously for a $2 trillion bill. They're going to vote unanimously, my guess is, if they get an infrastructure. I also think that, you know, America's commitments overseas to go to war in various places what's happening to ourselves from this virus and, and from this pandemic and what is really important and what is really worth fighting for. I think there's a lot of thinking going to go on about the whole post-Cold War structure and what we ought to do with regard to China and Russia and Europe, as a matter of fact. But it has been interesting, Eleanor, that in Europe, the as much as Viktor Orban, the leader of Hungary, has taken it onto himself to have these quite, um, well, the centralization of ex executive authority beyond parliamentary remit, there is also a, a sense of solidarity between you know, Spaniards, Italians, British people, uh, that perhaps could lead to some kind of greater awakening. So it's, it's hard to know what this means for international politics. Oh, and there may be solidarity, but people are terrified about what Viktor Orban did. I mean, he's basically just seized full power, and because he controls his party, controls the legislature, and allegedly it's only for this period of crisis. <laughs> There's no guarantee he's going to uh, lift it. I mean, I think that's a concern in this country, too. You see Attorney General Barr standing there at some of these press briefings, and they, he's talked about uh, taking on other powers. So um, he, he, you don't, you, you want a strong commander-in-chief, you want a strong leader. You don't want somebody thinking that he can take over virtually every aspect of government because people are scared. But you know, Eleanor, people are being, they're pushing Trump to take over more authority, to shut down the country, to order the governor in Florida to do this and that. And I think executives, as against legislators, executives are going to rise like Cuomo and others. At the same time, I think the real winner here, if you look at Europe, is nationalism. Look at the Italians are dealing separately with the problem. The Germans are, are not being as, as receptive as they could be to the request from the Italians. Spanish are dealing. Chinese are moving into various countries. Hungary's Orban is going his own way. I think this idea of, frankly, you talk about diversity. I think a diversity of kinds of governments is something that may be coming to Europe. 
I'd like to point out that the president's uh, stay in place order does not uh, supersede uh, state governments. It's it's guidance. It's not a directive. It is not. Everybody's yeah. all, right, all right, all right. Let's bring Clarence in. Power. I Let's think, bring Clarence. No, I think uh, uh, Donald Trump has really set back the cause of nationalism uh, by by causing a, a revival of interest in states' rights by uh, Democratic-led uh, led states and uh, uh, as well as uh, just independently minded governors like, like uh, in, in Maryland uh, where, uh, because uh, you know they're able to get uh, things done more quickly now at the state level of only they had the money and the, and the supplies uh, that's been the big problem and uh, President Trump uh, himself uh, has, has some well he sent mixed signals on that shall we say uh, whether or not you've got to be a friend of his in order to get aid for your state but, but, that is the kind of issue the Clarence, that Clarence, be like hasn't that. He Clarence, hasn't Trump pretty much shut down the borders? We talk about between our country and other countries. I'm, I'm talking about uh, the United States hasn't shut down the borders. He's really left it up to the states to uh, deal with more of this crisis than the, the states should have to deal with. Okay. Emily, concluding comment. <laughs> um, I, I guess that's an interesting theory. <laughs> <laughs> I that's see you in the store there, though. <laughs> okay, interesting theory. 